Okay, well, after that little enjoyable bit of nonsense, I, bl I believe you can't see me, but anyway, uh, the, uh, hopefully you can hear me and you can see the pictures. That's the main thing. So in this last talk, I want to look at a few sacred places of our time. It's certainly true that stylistically, they're as varied as modern architecture has become and as varied as religious practices. And with the value placed in the modern world on all things novel or unique, you can be sure to find sacred places of every shape and size imaginable. So with such diversity, I'm not going to make any attempt to convey a general picture. And, and nor am I going to get involved with liturgical issues, although there have been many changes. Um, Peter Hammond, who was a writer in the 1950s, was very critical of most modern churches, particularly in Britain, because they made, in his view, so little effort to respond to what he described as the 20th century liturgical revolution to something far more personal and participative than in the past. Uh, clearly, this is an important issue, but it's a different discussion from the one that I've embarked on. So I'm going to concentrate on only six modest places, and all but one are churches, the, the last one's a temple, um, which, like the places from history that we've been looking at, embody particular conceptions of God or heaven or of what is sacred, and our attempts to evoke particular experiences of holiness. To give you some idea of the range that there is around, evangelical Christianity builds mega churches such as this one, the Lakewood Church in Houston. And internally, it's simply an arena which could be used for anything uh, up to pop stars. And externally, it speaks a language of banal commercial corporatism. Cathedrals are still built, such as this enormous crystal, so-called crystal cathedral in Garden Grove, California, which was designed for the Reformed Church in America, which uses a high-tech architectural language typical of office buildings globally, and like a giant commodity, aims for high image value. That's the interior of it. Absolutely enormous place. And the exteriors of three churches uh, give some idea of the diversity among well-known serious architects, such as the one in Rome made of abstract shell-like pieces, one in Denmark below that, designed in a kind of industrial vernacular, and one in the United States designed with a branch-like structure to fit its forest site. And that pluralism in churches is matched by that of contemporary mosques. So you can certainly see remnants of old ideas here, the dome and the minaret, the use of the elevated plane and so on. But apart from that, the kind of forms used, you could just as easily find in contemporary so-called iconic designs for entertainment centers. So. I'm going to start with um, a church described as a noble room. It's Unity Temple of 1906 by Frank Lloyd Wright. And for reasons that I'll explain briefly, it could be argued that it was the first modern church. It, it might even be argue, argued to be the first modern building. The client was the Unitarian Church one which in its theology puts a major emphasis on the power of reason. And Wright liked to tell how he challenged the committee who were briefing him by telling a story of a holy man who, in trying to find God, climbed a high mountain and a tree at the top. And when he reached the top, there was a voice saying, go back down. It's there that you will find God. Thus, Wright told them, why not build a temple to man rather than to God? or as he put it, a noble room in the service of man for the worship of God. There was by then already a substantial body of nonconformist 
Protestant churches, which could be described as noble rooms like this one. But Wright was this great egotist who liked to be seen to be original. He also said that it was to be entirely free of all historical symbolic reference. However, although he abhorred classicism, if you look at the plan, it's difficult to imagine that he didn't know about Leonardo's drawing of a man in a circle and, and square. And he plainly used the perfect square because it was perfect. And you can also see that the building has a just as balanced a symmetry as any Renaissance plan. Having said that, there is no circle, no dome related to the square. And he is, as he said he was, putting man at the center. It's a secular version of a sacred place. Although there were some elements of, tra of tradition, there's no doubt that it was very innovative in many ways. And I'll touch on just two of them. The first one, functional. If you look at the cross section down below, you'll see that the square space is close to a cube. That's this space down here. It's pretty close to a cube, two stories high. And with seating in the stalls down at the bottom here and on these two balconies, um, it, it was very focused space with everybody as close as possible to everybody else and to the minister. And in addition, the extra height gives the space stature as a noble room. There was also much that was innovative in the planning to show that he's here really inventing an entirely new kind of church type. For example, you enter, uh, you actually, you can see where the entrance is, you enter from behind the pulpit, which is right here. So you enter here or here, and, and you can enter downstairs uh, to a lower level and then come up at one of these stairs at the back in the plan or one of these stairs so you can move around the church at a lower level underneath and see where you can sit without disturbing anybody and that lower level also connects to the cloakrooms below the church where you can leave your boots and your wet raincoat or whatever so it's, it's, uh, it, there are many more ways that it's functionally new like that, but uh, we don't have time to go into all of those. And the, the second more important one at this point for me is the spatial innovation. Oh, wrong way. And Wright considered this building to be a major breakthrough in his career. It was here, he said, that he had suddenly recognized an entirely new sense of architecture, a higher conception as space enclosed. It's the enclosed space rather than the building enclosing it that is the reality. And essentially what he meant was this, up till now, because the walls of a building were essential to carry the, lo uh, the loads of the roof and the floor, uh, to uh, floors to the foundation, architecture had primarily been about designing all that solid matter. But now, with a new technology of flat roofs supported on concrete columns, you could do what you liked with the walls. So space was freed from the enclosure and could become the major medium of design. The enclosure of walls, windows, and roofs would simply be an expression of the design space. And that understanding was one that actually changed the face of architecture worldwide. So the outside was to be an expression of the inside. And you can see here how uh, the cubic geometric theme of the inside with its high up windows shows itself outside and is given emphasis by the wide eaves over the windows and how it's restated with slight variation in every part of the outside. So this is, this is the main church. This is the subsidiary buildings here, which you can see is the same kind of theme, but slightly different. And even at a little kind of entrance portico place, there's the same kind of spatial theme as being 
is being shown outside. So that so this space inside, in a sense, expands to the outside, and is the elevation of the building, what it looks like, is a discovery in in a certain way. That was the great idea. Looking more closely at how he exploited the technology in the design of the noble room, it meant that he could achieve excellent visibility he wanted with wide uh, galleries and no columns as obstructions. He could tuck those windows high up with their colored leaded lights right under the roof that would give it a kind of numinous quality. And he could make the roof itself of the main space with a deep structural grid through which light filters through colored glass. And the result is this spacious, numinous quality and a warm, focused human space, which, as Wright imagined it, is a kind of receptacle for the light of God from the sky onto man down there on earth. Added to this, he worked very hard to achieve a visual unity of the complex parts. And inside, the room as a whole, the pulpit, the light fittings, the hangings, all obey the same spatial laws. Even the patterns in the roof light. So the noble room also speaks of God's unity. If Wright's Unity Temple had this numinous quality of light as a kind of byproduct of designing an elevated meeting room, we're now going to look at a church where it's the central objective. And this is the, uh, it's the Miramaki Lutheran Church by an architect called Juha Leviska in the outskirts of Helsinki. And it's on a long, narrow, skinny site between the railway on the left in the plan and a little wood of birches on the right. Perhaps you can read in the plan that it's made of a multiplicity of vertical planes with windows between, and the tower on the right-hand side there is emblematic of that spatial theme. So Leviska works to inspire users of the church with God's light in three ways. Firstly, he makes of light a kind of impressionistic melody of great depth. And using planes of varying opacity and transparency, he creates layer upon layer of veils of light, almost as if the place is built of the depth of holy light, from darkness to brilliance. Always there, but as you can imagine, changing always over the day and the passing seasons. Secondly, there's a lot of emphasis on the vertical to take your eyes upward. So we read the edges of plans as well as the faces. And the windows are long vertical slots. The surfaces have vertical striations and windows mainly vertical divisions. And there are many sources of light high up. And thirdly, it's extraordinarily harmonious. Everything is drawn into the same unity of form and whiteness. The pews and the ceiling are composed of the same visual material as the elements of the walls, and their horizontality balances the verticality in the walls. Every element is abstracted and dematerialized in the same way. There's not a jarring note anywhere. In a strange way, it seems to do with light what Gala Placida, Placidia did with darkness. In these layers of light, it inspires feelings of mystery and wonder. And by dematerializing weighty structure, it creates a sense of expansion far beyond its actual size, while the subtlety and delicacy of the elements makes it kindly and personal. And this theme penetrates the entire building. Large elements like the organ and small ones like altars and fonts, giving everything a gentle human dimension. 
The theme also penetrates the entire building. Um, uh, not only the worship area. So here yeah, the side chapel and the church hall. And it's present externally too, where on the entrance side, that verticality works very well with the birch trees on the, on the front side of it. And on the back, those solid planes help to protect it from the railway. And in addition to the heightened spiritual quality achieved, you have the feeling when you visit this church that it does fulfill contemporary liturgical needs well too. There's a very unhierarchical and participatory arrangement of the pews, all close to the minister and to where the rituals are performed. So the Miramaki Church achieves the quality of harmony and oneness through its consistency in architectural language and its use of light. Derived incidentally from neoplasticism of Mondrian of Pondusburg of the 1920s. Now we're going to move to one of uh, 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 one of those church. Or sorry, we're going to move to a church where those qualities of harmony and oneness are nowhere nowhere more deeply present in modern churches that I've seen. That's in St Mark's Church in Stockholm by somebody called Sigurd Leverance. Leverance accomplished an environment of extraordinary consonance and integration in several ways, but I'm going to concentrate on two. The building he made is a metaphor of nature. Everything seems to obey the same rules just as a body does. And allied with this, the building is ordered by human experience. It seems to respond appropriately to your size, your movement, your sensibility. So, the building is made like a natural phenomenon, as I've said, like the body of an animal or a tree, not in any way to look like one, but harmonious in the way that it is, with a particular character as a whole in which every part seems to fit, has an appropriate role to play, and is made with love and care. And three examples, I hope, are, are going to show this. The outer layer of bricks is treated like a skin. Each brick is kept whole and, and each the same as the other, but also a little different, like the cells on the skin. And the layer can stretch like skin, where it, for instance, meets sloping edges on the left-hand side or goes around curves on the right. Or it can wrinkle when it needs to or carry old scars. And looking at the skin, the trees and their bark and the leaves and the grass, it almost seems as if the same hand made them all. You can't see much of the roof, but where it is visible, each piece seems to be precious. Like the scales and eyelids and eyes of a creature are precious. And all the ordinary things like gutters and downpipes are phrased as, as living metaphors. They don't just do functional things. They talk about collecting and pouring and channeling water. And thirdly, look at these doors, how different they are. They show how the breaks in the skin, the doors and windows are handled with the same complexity as natural phenomena each one particular to that part of the building, just as an eye or nostril or navel fulfilling particular functions in particular positions are particular. So the entrance door is friendly and transparent. That's on the left, the door next to admin, more private, but sensibly showing the head of a visitor from, from the inside and, and the door on the right to the store and archive is more secure, but giving some light to the interior. So I hope that these, this brief introduction gives you some sense that of what I, what I feel that Leverance is, is achieving a transcendence by making the building as if it were made by God. The second 
and perhaps primary kind of order leverance creates is what I would call of sensory experience. Wherever you go in the building, it seems responsive to all your senses in an appropriate way. And the image I have is uh, of, uh, of a loving mother to her child. So at the entry, there's a slight rise in the path that gives a sense of expectation, which you read in your legs and underfoot too in the sound of gravel and stone pathway. The round tower is a visual and tactile attraction to go around, and you do go around it and down into the entrance court. It's a very humane experience to go down to a sacred place. And the court is very intimate, a calm place for elderly people to chat and children to play. The broad pool emphasizes the horizontality and tranquility. And there's this little fountain which sparkles and plays its gentle tune. At the main entrance, a lively interactive place, is a canopy with a lively rhythm of low vaults, which could shelter everybody from the rain. And it positively vibrates with texture. The rough wall, the cobbles under your feet, the warm golden timber of the door and deep brown of the thick structure and the brilliant line of light. Then you step inside and something of the outside remains, but the floor becomes smoother and shinier. The vaults echo those outside, but in a white plaster. It's intimate and practical. An in-between space with display windows for church goods and notices. And on your left, hooks to hang up raincoats and hats. In the hall, everything changes again a little. It's a higher space. The bricks have a warmer color and work in harmony with a honey colored floor and wooden cupboards and roof structure to make a warm, a friendly place. From here, you step into the worship space and the atmosphere changes again. There are small patches of brilliant light, but it takes time for your eyes to get accustomed to the darkness. The walls and roof are of the same material as outside and much of the floor is of slate. So you're in an elemental space again, a cave-like space. It's not easy to see where the space ends. It seems to expand in all directions, horizontally and vertically. And it seems to carry many of the meanings we've seen in previous cave-like spaces of the mystery of birth and death, of the incommensurability of God, the warmth and succor of the earth. And it has a benign human dimension evoked by the soft warmth of the, peer, of the pews, windows that come down to a level that you can see out of, the modesty of the spaces, and a certain informality in the arrangement, as well as the powerful sense of protection from the thick walls and the wash of light that turns quite ordinary things into poetry. In this kind of way, it's made to embody and enable the experience of a motherly God. And by the way, it's worth noting too that the whole layout is ordered by the golden mean, i.e. by proportional relationships considered from early times to be the most perfect. I'm sure many people, when contemplating the majesty of nature or its exquisite detail, its abundance or its starkness, will have had the experience of almost overwhelming awe that seems to talk of another reality. And some churches, rather like Zen temples, are, des are designed around this experience. They offer a quiet and protected focus on nature so that we may be inspired to wonder and reverence. And the little chapel, oh, sorry, there we are. The little chapel by the Finnish architects Kaya and Heki Siren is one. It's in a university campus in Otaniemi on the outskirts of Helsinki. And the student body who commissioned it 
told the architects they wanted the chapel to remind them of the wholeness of life and the values of human life. And the response was to design a place for tranquil contemplation of what is most characteristic of Finland, the locus of its mythology and the inspiration of much of its art, architecture, music and literature, the forest. So it's situated in an area at a high point of the campus, wooded with birch, roan, and pine trees. And it's planned as a distinctive short journey. As you approach, there are already simple signs. You step up and enter a forecourt fenced with rough poles and with a red brick wall on each side. It's quite informal, shaded with forest trees and not fully enclosed. There's a very familiar atmosphere, very modest in form and meaning, like a traditional farmhouse with its yard with wooden fences. It's an in-between space, ordered, but still redolent with the smells, textures, sounds, and sensations of the forest. From here, as you can see in the plan and cross section, you move into a low, close entry hall, the ceiling of which set up a little before you enter the chapel space. I'll just point that out. Uh, so in plan, you come in here and you move through here into a low space, and then you're out into the chapel and the organs over here. In section, you can see this is the court space you're inside, up a few steps into a very low space, into an entry, and then into a taller chapel. So that's the entry uh, on the left going inside the wall and on the right, rather a poor photograph from a book, which is looking back from the chapel space towards the entry where you can see that low ceiling. The chapel is a wide, generous, barn-like space built in warm colored materials. And where you would expect the most sacred part to be, there's this great window onto the forest. The broad horizontality of the place, seating in the window, helps to create a sense of rest and tranquility. And the cross outside sanctifies the forest, again in all weathers. The walls are built with second-hand bricks from a bombed out uh, building from the Second World War, and the rough texture somehow reflects the roughness of the earth, while the timber trusses are designed in a way to reflect something of the branches of the trees and the forests, thus setting up a kind of conversation between the building and the forest. And as you can see, the design of the font is a transparent bowl on the left and the communion table are all reduced to obstruct as little as possible the connection with the forest. So it's been a gentle, humane process that's carried you, as it were, from the forest of ordinary experience through two layers into a holy building where you have revealed to you the sacredness of the forest. Distinctive but short. Now we'll go to Japan, where you would expect the journey to be an essential feature of the sacred place, and certainly as important as the end it is to reach. And this is in a, a Buddhist temple by Tadeo Ando. Now, as an architect generally, whether of secular or sacred buildings, Ando aims to make places of order and tranquility. He works almost without exception in a monochrome or shutter concrete, in simple structures of square columns and beams and unpunctured walls, constructing pure spaces carefully bathed in light. Indeed, his work is consistently background and often like this one, literally underground and understated. It's a critique of the boastful and narcissistic architecture of our time. And his buildings, sacred or not, consistently as aspire for perfection. So he uses elementary geometry and builds with the greatest care imaginable. 
That he does so may be a personal trait, but it's also an important part of the Japanese tradition of making. In Shintoism and Buddhism, everything in nature, and also in human-made things, is potentially sacred. Thus, to make anything shoddy would be shameful. In this, in many ways, although his works unequivocally of its time, is profoundly rooted in the Japanese tradition of making meditative sacred places. And in any such place, the journey, as the metaphor of the Buddhist way to enlightenment, is an integral part of the whole. And normally it has four main characteristics. It's not very direct and often meanders. It's imbued with deep cultural concepts and practices. When you arrive at places, there are ambiguities, spaces that open out your imagination. And the stages along the way create a kind of layering of space around the building, which denotes its privacy and holiness. This is connected with the concept of aku, which describes a multi-layered centripetal, i.e. going inwards, spatial organization. And Ando's water temple on an, on an island near Osaka exemplifies this kind of sacred space as a journey. The plan shows the journey. And if you can follow from number one over here on the right, this is an existing cemetery. You go up this pathway and then turn off on this little path, uh, on this smaller pathway that meanders through some trees and arrives over here at a, a, a kind of layered entrance that we look at just now, winds around this side of the wall, comes back and around this end to over here. This is now the pool and goes down through the pool to the bottom there at six. And from there, it actually winds around underneath and ends up about over here. So it's a very long, um, a curvy um, and quite, in, in many places, ambiguous journey. So on the left, there's a little bodhisattva at the cemetery, which gives uh, an entrance to that pathway off the old pathway. And on the right is the winding path through the trees and hedges. And, and that skirts a, a gravel patch with a high concrete wall on the edge. And the wall's clearly a layer you have to pass through. And there's this large opening, which you can see in the, in the background there, showing the way. The opening makes you pause because you come up against a blank curving wall. I, I see it as a, a, a modern version of a torii gate that denotes entry to a sacred precinct. And on entry, you must turn sharp right along the wall and you find yourself in this chasm-like space between two walls, which instantly to the touch are absolutely silky to, to feel. That opens out a little. It's very elemental. Walls and paths, gravel, trees, and sky. There's a very strong sense of what is known as ma, a kind of dynamic silence and emptiness. And set off against each other, everything seems to take on new metaphoric meaning, just as a painting or a poem speaks of far more than what they literally represent. Okay, then you bend around the wall until the path turns um, 190, 180 degrees around the edge of the inner wall into another layer of space along a concave curve which holds the edge of the still pool. The pool denotes cleansing and purification in a sacred place. You move to a bridge over which you must cross just as on many shrine sites, you cross a sacred bridge over the sacred water. And the next layer takes you plunging down another chasm-like space into the pool, as it were. And at the bottom, there's another uncertain ambiguity where you've got to choose your way. 
A wall lined with painted timber and a red painted translucent screen help you choose and you find your way past them and move around an increasingly dark corridor and finally emerge in the little temple buried cave-like in the middle. There's very little light and your process has made you feel deep in the earth. Being small, warm in color and made in the familiar iconography of simple wooden construction, tatami mats and screens, and a traditional arrangement for meditation and prayer, it feels like Mother Earth. Now, Ando has always said that his architectural mentor is the French Swiss architect, Le Corbusier, probably the most influential architect of the 20th century. And we'll finish off with one of his churches. He once said that while he was always viewed as revolutionary, everything he did was based on the lessons of the past. So when he came to produce some of his really seminal buildings that, that he called machines for living in, which did fundamentally change the house in Western society, he based them, geometrically speaking, exactly on historical models, specifically on Palladio, whom we've seen before. And like Palladio, he ordered his buildings according to a mathematical system of proportions, the modulo which he devised, also based on a male form. And you can see Johnny Jacobson there doesn't quite match up to it. But he even used that system in the Ranchon Chapel we're going to look at, which appears to be a free sculptural form. Notre Dame du Hall, above the village of Ranchon, is a pilgrim chapel on a hilltop, as you can see, in the east of France, which had been holy in pre Christian times. And it was built to replace a medieval chapel, which was destroyed in the Second World War. Now, there are many ways of looking at such an extraordinary architectural work, and I'm going to approach it only along one avenue, as a building which is aimed to express the sacred by connecting in a profound way with the whole landscape. It's almost as if it's made in, in a way that in it, you can see something of the process of creation. As a pilgrim chapel, it's organized to be approached by pilgrims on a journey climbing up from the bottom of the hill in a series of spatial episodes. So from near the bottom, you're mainly struck with a huge roof connecting in scale with the rounded banks and the curving, slightly curving path and the trees and hedge and with the rounded tower, which stands like a monolith in the, in the landscape. Closer by, you can see that in a kind of gap between the massive roof, the tower, and an equally massive white wall dotted with perforations that sweeps in a curve off and up under the roof on the right, there seems to be a colorful door. And near the door, uh, near the top, the big door next to the tower is clear and welcoming with its images of landscape and clouds, a star, a pyramid, rain, and the open hand. However, there's even here, there's a slight ambiguity about where to go because the curving wall on the right kind of urges you into a forecourt space. And I hope these oblique views of that wall give some sense of that. And they show the Corbusier making something more like a massive overhang on a mountain face than the eaves of a building and how the building holds the outside, outside space and how its roundedness works with that of the hilltop. The space it holds, even though not flat, does have that being on another level of existence nature we've met before and looks out over the distant rounded hills. This space connects you to the east end of the building where there's another curved wall under the roof, making a space that connects outwards to the slightly sloping lawn. It's an exterior apse 
or sanctuary. And you can see the altar and cross and pulpit there, designed, placed, and related in a very powerful elemental way. It has a primitive feel about it, pre-Christian, prehistoric. It's the sanctuary for open to the sky services. Uh, you can't see it in this photograph, but this outside space reaches the edge of the hilltop in a mound and a little ziggurat built of the ruins of the bombed chapel. And the backdrop, that's the, 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 the little ziggurat. And the backdrop through the trees is the mountains in the distance. The other two sides of the building reinforce the connection of it with the landscape. They're made of convex rather than concave walls, forming a kind of back. And the main elements are those three towers, which like giant dolmens, anchor the fluid composition of curved walls and the roof to the ground. And between them, two of them, there's the water spout for the whole roof. It's also of elemental scale. And it reaches out to pour the water in a crash onto hard angular stones. It's like a place of titans. Rosha is a very little building. It's only 13 meters by 25. But together, it's, it's like a piece of mountain and it speaks the language of the geology. It's built to talk to the hilltop it sits on and to the whole landscape of mountains and valleys. And inside, it's a cave. When you enter that wide pivot door, you, can ex you experience the thickness of the wall, which is about two meters. And the space you enter is cave-like. The curved roof is like a great stone with its narrow gap between it and the walls. In some of the solid walls, you can see tiny punctures of light as if through the uneven walls of a cave. And the floor has the slope of the hilltop. It moves you involuntarily down towards the, the altar. Although it's not a big space, it's made of massive elements. Thick walls, giant boulder roof, hilltop floor. And the wall on your right is the great curving one with punctures we saw from the outside. Inside, it's this beautiful deep screen filled with light. It changes over the day, sometimes warmed with color and at others ablaze with light. There is this elemental scale, but there's also intimacy. The side chapels below the towers are hollows filled with warm light. They are intimate, gentle spaces. The panes of the small windows that puncture the wall are painted with colorful, seemingly childlike images and inscriptions, evocative images like those we saw in the sand caves at the beginning of these talks. And as you move around and inside the building, there's a growing sense of being in a space of existence outside of or beyond the normal and which is augmented by all kinds of ambiguities the huge roof is so lightly supported the south wall solid outside and full of light inside the towers powerful obelisks outside and soft hollows inside and all the spaces we've experienced seem to be almost without dimension or collectively to speak of a universal dimension, inside and outside, great and small, powerful and delicate, universal and private, austere and colorful, serious and playful, building and landscape, all seem to merge effortlessly. Le Corbusier was an athe atheist and once said, I have not experienced the miracle of faith, but I've often known the miracle of inexpressible space. And like the designers of many of the places we've looked at, he's surely built here with all kinds of ordinary materials, a sacred space which profoundly transcends the ordinary. A metaphor of those spaces in nature, tiny as a curl of a leaf or mighty as a mountain range. 
which make you gasp with inexpressible wonder. And so we come to the end of this short exploration of sacred spaces, and I'm going to try and find my way out of it here again. I think to exit. Go on there, right? It's clear to me that the modern places that I've chosen and the next five or so that I would choose retain in strong measure the most ancient metaphors from history, even though their form may have undergone some considerable change. So the way God is embodied and how the spatial framework and atmosphere are set up to assist the experience of holiness still seem to have the same components as they did at the dawn of history. The cave embracing the intimate. Yeah? Can't you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, yes, okay. we can hear you. Okay, sorry. The cave embracing an intimate and also dark and limitless, with its elemental meaning of shelter and its close connection with Mother Earth, the mysterious source of our being and survival, and the mysterious place to which we return. The mountain up which we climb or the sky to which we aspire to realms beyond our understanding or the light which inspires us with elevated thought and bathes us in wisdom and holiness. The way or journey which we undertake by definition of being creatures that are born, live and die and which may enable us to come to some form of enlightenment or move from one state of being to another. And to these three, we should clearly add water, the precious substance which blesses us with life, slakes our thirst, and which washes and purifies us, and the sacred precinct, accessible to the profane world, but also separate from it, enabling a freedom from it so that one can get some perspective of it and venture into realities outside of it. The shift in these modern sacred spaces seems to me to be from a generalized conventional character to something much more personal and humane. Personal in the sense that each designer, like Abbe Suger, is almost single-handedly inventing forms to focus meanings he or she decides to be central. Also personal in the sense that as a participant, one's not faced with one conventional interpretation of a holy temple, but is offered something that will take a wide range of interpretation. Somehow one is more personally involved as a reader of their meaning. Obviously there are dangers in this, but there's both an intimacy and openness which, about it, which is surely appropriate for our time. And finally, I want to say that of all the impressions I had in putting these talks together, two struck me most forcibly. Today, we're engaged, very engaged, with the image of the places we make. That they should be, exci they should be excitingly different from the norm. But with all these sacred places, what they look like is much less important than what they are. What they are is complex places experienced with the senses and in time and movement. What they are is kind of psychological containers. And what they are is deep carriers of meaning from antiquity to the present. Their content is just as important as their form. And the second impression is a sense of wonder at our profound common humanity. <laughs> that it doesn't matter whether we've lived thousands of years ago or now, whether we come from the desert in the Middle East or the plains of India or the mountains of Africa or verdant hills of Europe, whether we're Hindu, Christian, Muslim, or indeed atheist, we've all battled to construct places which make manifest and enable experience of our deeper searching and belief in roughly the same ways. And so we can recognize each other's battles. So thank you very much. That, that will be that. I'm happy to take questions if there are any.
Thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Alex, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you, uh, Julian. Um, I've yet to find that photograph where you and I were on Vitz campus together, and I might let you see that when I get hold of it. I'd, I'd um, enjoy that. Yes, I, yeah, we, we've got a couple of buildings that have been built by some of your students. Uh, uh, Paul de Villiers, do you remember him? Yes, I know Paul de Villiers. Well, the, the house we built in, uh, we live in, uh, it shows some of the characteristics of your last lecture. Oh, good. Oh, well, he was always a great, he was always a great student. I taught him. Yes, I think he went, he finished up in England. Is he still there? Uh, I don't know. I haven't heard from him for years. Yeah, well, you know, it'd be nice to see you again after 50 years. Yeah, it would be good. My question was, in dealing with your last architect, how does an atheistic architect satisfactorily seek to embody God if he or she does not essentially believe in a God? I don't know, but I think what, what, he, what he was trying to say was, although he hadn't experienced faith in the way that one might experience faith, he nevertheless still has an experience of the world that fills him with wonder and awe and of dimensions beyond himself. So, and in fact, I mean, Corbusier built a wonderful monastery and also an, a, another church as well. So, um, so he, 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 certainly, he certainly had a sense of, of things beyond the now and beyond this place. And he was, he was because he was such a, 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 a brilliant genius of a person, he was able to uh, transcend his own beliefs and still make something that that uh, sort of held with with the beliefs of the world and which he could recognize in other buildings around the world yeah did, 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 did you get a sense of the divine when you went into those places yeah it, it's it's a very profoundly moving space spaces inside and and out mm -hmm. And when you go there, you know, there's just this, uh, there's an atmosphere of silence and reverence that's quite amazing. And, and, and do you think we've got better than we were two or three centuries ago when it comes to building a sacred place? I don't know. And I think in many ways we've probably got worse. But there are, but there are you know, because I think people, we, we, we are, we are, we're not a very religious world now. Right. And uh, so I think people find it more difficult to get into. In fact, if you look around in uh, in architectural libraries, you won't find very much on just churches. Whereas when you travel around looking at historical architecture, most of the time or a lot of the time, you, you're you looking around churches. So, so there has been a big shift. And I think people have got out of... And they don't they don't work it collectively in the way that they used to. It's... it's uh, 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 but I think, you know, that, that goes for perhaps more in the Western world than it does for the rest of the world. You know, in Africa, of course, there's still, uh, it's still profoundly religious and, and, in, and in a lot of the Eastern countries too. Yeah. My, my last comment is that in those Scandinavian countries that you chose for your last lecture, they mm. have become increasingly secular. And the question yeah. is... Do those churches attract the same sort of attention as the earlier churches did? Because yeah, they do. To be yeah, they have attracted much in the way of a congregation. Yeah, they do. When we went, that that little church of Levisco was full of activity. Even you know during the day, it wasn't a Sunday or anything. But there were there were kids uh, there were kids and youth groups there and all sorts of things going on. It was very active, lively congregation. And the same with the one in. Um, in uh, in Sweden and uh, St Mark's Church in Stockholm, it was it was full of activity. They they run a a, 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 a nursery school there, and you know lots of activity all the time. Well, so really it, it was quite it was quite difficult to get to, to an auditorium for a rock group, you know. Yeah. 
And near this full. Where so was this? Houston. Oh. Uh, Kate is there in there, Julian. Okay. Okay. Hello, okay. <laughs> Hello again. Hello. Um, two, okay. two questions. Um, mm. First of all, yeah. we changed it. Mm. What's What's your immediate reaction when I say which one was which um, building takes your socks off? Like you when you went to the Taj Mahal, was that the one that really stands out? Or what, what, wow. what? <laughs> you know that I think the thing is they all they all work in different ways, don't they? I mean the Egyptian yeah. temples are mind blowing. The to go into a cave in the Drakensberg where there's uh, where there's where there are these an ancient paintings on the wall, so exquisitely yeah. beautiful. It, um, you know, uh, with the modern ones, um, the um, the St. Mark's Church is. When when we went there as a group of architects, we couldn't leave the place, people, and we couldn't stop photographing everything. It's just every little detail of it is is thought about. So. And so, so it's it's really very difficult to say because they all absorb you in different ways, different yeah, parts of yeah. you, you know. Yeah, and some, of course, are very modest and others are very, very grandiose. Yeah. Um, really. So uh, I wouldn't say there's any one particular one that, that I respond to. Of the modern ones, I definitely feel closest to the St. Mark's in, uh, in Stockholm because it, I find it incredibly humane humane space, set of spaces. Um, but, you know, uh, uh, there's so many wonderful places. <laughs> and to go yeah. to India, well, we went to India last year and I saw a whole lot of places that I, that I feel ashamed to have been ignorant of. You know, they're so amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not just the Taj Mahal, lots and lots. <laughs> of, mm. Yeah. Uh, and and I, I just wondered whether in the Western Cape, whether particularly contemporary churches that uh, also have that amazing feeling, you know, whether like Joe Nuero's, I don't know if you've been to his recent one, Somerset West or Pierce Parles and Belleville. Um, yeah. I think, I think there, there are, there, there are, there are, there are lots of places I think that one can go to, but I, you know, I can't, I can't pull out my favourite ones now, but <laughs> um, the, the, uh, you, you need to look around. I mean, one thing about uh, going to other parts of the world is you do see architecture at its very highest, and yeah. um, and that's fairly uncommon here. Uh, mm. uh, so 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 you have to hunt. Well, you have to hunt around everywhere, but um, but you you certainly do here. But there, there, of course, there are there are wonderful spaces here too. Mm. Yeah. Mm. And I just wondered, um, this is a bit of a personal question. So when, when you are at your chosen place of worship, how do you like focus and like not look at the stained windows on the right or worry about the pipes of the organ? <laughs> or, or <you> just <laughs> well, I, I think that the, the best place is you, you don't really notice all the funny little bits and pieces. I mean, in that Leverance Church, when I was talking about the the, the beauty of the, the way everything is uh, the way everything is made like an animal, but then you can see a bit of electrical work that's obviously been stuck on later that spoils everything really. But you don't really notice that. So, so I think if you get absorbed in a building and and let it come at you and feel your way around it and maybe not use your head too much, but but rather your movement and your emotions and your your, your your whole being, then I then I think you, you you that's the best way to explore a place and spend time there and quiet quiet time there that you can yeah yeah uh, thank you thank so you much Kate. sure Caroline has a hand up Caroline no. you can pose your question um yeah thank you that was a really really interesting lecture series thank you for doing that thank I realised it must have been a ton of work to put together and not an easy format either um so thank you for that um so my question is um kind of related to the question i asked the other day which is about innovation in architecture and i'm thinking mm -hmm. really about western church architecture um and 
I, I kind of wonder if you agree with my observation here and if you understand why it might be, which is it always seems to me that in church architecture, there was loads and loads and loads of innovation in the 12th, 13th, 14th, 15th centuries. Mm. And then it kind of basically stopped uh, until about the Gaudi and then the 20th century. So if you mm. look at but, um, you know, the major churches that were built between about, I don't know, 15, 1600 mm. and the you know, 20th century, basically nothing really happened. So lots of the churches then and, and big cathedrals in particular are basically just reusing the same or the old style. So, um, you know, St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York, for example, was basically a French Gothic cathedral just built in with modern materials. Mm. Or um, the cathedral in Truro in Cornwall in southwest England, for example, is just a French Gothic cathedral just built in the uh, in the 1900s, but with more modern materials. Mm. Um, and it's supposed to be kind of nothing really happened <laughs> in terms of innovation until yeah. Gaudi and the types of buildings that you've been talking about today. And I wonder if you kind of agree with that observation. And and if so, like, or even St Paul's Cathedral, right, which was obviously built in the late yeah. 19th century, and that's basically a classical building, so it's an out of the box classical building, right? Yeah. Why why was that? What was the big kind of break <laughs> on innovation? Well, I think, I mean, firstly, I think that, you know, one tends to be slightly prejudiced about all these things. I mean, we've everybody's always been very prejudiced about the 19th century, well, until maybe 1960 or something like that, when people started to take notice and see that there was a whole lot of innovation there, actually. And, you know, once, I mean, if one just takes the 19th, the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, you you, you do tend to say that, it was just this crazy battle of stars and nobody really knew what to do and it was all just using all the old things over again in different ways. But you could argue that the um, the, the, the works of, I mean, if you just take the House of Parliament, there'd never been built a place like the House of Parliament before. It was actually, it was, it, it was a really a completely new kind of building because it had this classical kind of, uh, layout framework thing and then it it was turned into something that was made with a kind of a gothic detail but which was which was working with medieval kind of detailing but it wasn't actually like it and so on so that uh, you know so that I, I think if you start I mean if I think of um, uh, let me think that building in Oxford the uh, there's a museum in Oxford that R Ruskin absolutely hated which is a metal building um is it sort of gothic yeah. the gothic um, the natural history museum yeah that's it yeah, yeah. you know they, they they they're really outstanding buildings in their own ways and one, one tends to uh, i think it's partly the fault of historians sort of putting things together that you've come to appreciate some times better than others and i mean uh, when we went to france for instance fairly recently we went and looked at uh, a few churches, early 19th century uh, churches in France, uh, not early 19th, la latest 19th century churches in France, which were beginning to sort of feel the sort of concrete structure. Now, uh, you wouldn't you wouldn't normally go and look at those and probably don't know n know of them. I can't even even I, I can't take its its name off the top of my head. The one that I've got particularly in mind. So I think that there's a lot hidden away there in the background that one's been a bit prejudiced about because those periods haven't been sort of looked to as great times of art or architectural uh, wonder or anything, you know. And um, so, so I feel a bit, but having said all that, I must admit when I was putting this together, I was thinking, oh, what church should I use? What should I look at from around there? And I couldn't really actually think of one that I could pull to mind that that would sort of really, really show up as a, as as something as significant as a Gothic cathedral or you know one of those uh, classical works of the 15th or 16th centuries or anything like that. And so I kind of I'm a bit I'm a little bit skeptical about the question, but I also kind of agree with it. <laughs> Okay. I hope okay. it helps in some way or other. But... Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Oh, okay. I'm just looking at other hands.
There's quite a few comments in the chat. Uh, let me just read one or two out. I don't see any other hands, so I'll just read some okay. chats out. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating series, beautifully illustrated and explained the real experience. Hmm. And, uh, thank you, Julian. This has been a wonderful week of fascinating information and stunning views. I feel as if I was taken on a world tour from my couch. 